Thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, this is presented by Autodesk Fusion 360. And today this webinar is uh, your CNC machine shop on three plus two machining, smarter, better, faster, and more profitable. So we'll hop into the first slide. Um, little introduction myself. Uh, my name is Devin Dupuy. I'm a techno technical specialist here at Autodesk. Um, I have 10 plus years um, manufacturing experience and my specialties are advanced uh, manufacturing strategies, and then obviously uh, five, five axis CNC machinist or process engineer. I've worked for Autodesk for almost two years now. And prior to coming to Autodesk, I actually ran an aerospace CNC machine shop in Chicago, Illinois. And at, at the machine shop, we used and utilized Fusion 360 on a day-to-day -day basis for all of our model preparation um, fixture design, and then obviously programming um, these com these complex machines you see in front of you. Um, so, you know, hopefully I'll uh, have a little bit of expertise um, explaining fusion and some of the five axis stuff. Uh, moving on, this is just kind of an overview of, you know, what we're going to talk about today. Um, you know, we're obviously going to go over why, why three axis, a lot of companies are are confused they don't know if they if they should you know upgrade you know their machine or their equipment and you know look into these things in the future for their business um what advantages you know having multi-axis or even just a, a rotary indexer um could could have to your business um, so we'll, we'll move forward to the next slide here and then uh, as far as my agenda so this is what we're going to actually cover today so we're gonna the first thing we're going to tackle is why multi-axis why three plus two um, a lot of a lot of companies think, you know, hey, I don't make products like that, or I don't need um, equipment like that. And I want to show you really why this could be valuable. Uh, the next thing we'll get into is some examples. Um, now, I'm, we're not going to program every single example, but I do want to show specific strategies. And then there will be a one or two parts that we will uh, program um, to completion here to just kind of show a, a workflow in Fusion and how that could be, uh, you know, valuable to your business. Um, then we'll summarize with some of the benefits in the summary um, of, of what we have there. Uh, we'll follow that up with kind of a live Q&A session. And um, after that, we will we'll have just kind of a, a find out more. Um, so if you do want to, you know, obviously take some action from this, you're curious about, you know, fusion, curious about, you know, le learning more, uh, we will definitely have some contact information up there to, you know, reach out to us um, to hopefully answer any further questions you may or may not have. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about popping into this is machines, right? So machines, a lot of times can be a barrier to entry. I think the first thing that I think about when I start thinking about five axis is the machines are expensive, right? So if we take, you know, a machine like this and we put it next to a machine like this, these machines are, are very similar. Um, they are similar in size. They are similar in capability. Um, you know, tooling, spindle speeds, you know, RPMs, things like that. Um, the big difference here, though, is, is one of these machines costs, you know, almost, almost three times as much as the other. Now, um, we can put little, little uh, symbols here to kind of display that. But this is something to really take into account. You know, if we're making, you know, brackets and hammers and things like that, do we really need to have a machine that, you know, costs X amount more? And I would say it's, it's, pretty hard to argue if one is maybe three times more the cost, if it's actually three times better. Um, so, because at the end of the day, when I go to make a, a part or a component, my customer's not going to pay me, um, you know, three times as much because I made their component on a machine that, that costs more money. So this is really something to, you know, think about and kind of take into account when we are um, looking at, you know, specific equipment for our shop, you know, to upgrade to. The next thing I would say is um, the skills gap. Now, what I mean by skills gap is a lot of times, you know, companies won't invest in five axis equipment because they think that, you know, they have to have a really high end, you know, machinist, or it takes a long time to learn these things. And for the longest time, I've really always kind of equated the, the machines as like aircraft, right? I used to make a lot of parts for aircraft and I'm a, I'm a big aircraft enthusiast. So how I like to explain this is, you know, if we start looking at even something as simple as like a bridge port, you know, obviously I have a small, you know, little uh, aircraft here associated with that. But think of this as like the kind of machinist that people kind of perceive um, that, they, that they would need to have for this. And then if we move on to like a traditional CNC machine, 
Um, here, I would say this is a little bit, you know, kind of better of a better of a plane, obviously, but the machine and the capabilities and the requirements to program and produce components on this machine are, are greater than that of someone on a Bridgeport. Um, when we do step into five axis, obviously this is a pretty extreme machine. There are a lot of things going on here. There's two additional, you know, rotaries um, and there's a lot of, you know, collisions and these machines are expensive. So I would take, I would say the skill generally, you know, needed for somebody to operate a five axis machine is, is, is a little bit higher. One of the things that, that I've always thought about fusion, even, even when I was a customer, um, was fusion really bridges the gap here. You know, we can take somebody who, you know, can run a VF2 or make, you know, 3D parts, and they can really up-level themselves very easily because of, you know, modern technology, because of how work coordinate systems are translated in the machines. You know, Haas has something called dynamic work offsets, where we don't have to set four, five, six different offsets in our program. We really just set one. And with that one, we can track our part wherever it is. So it makes it a lot easier today to perform five axis than it has ever been in the future. Um, and fusion really is the thing that I feel bridges the gap here because, you know, going from 3D, you know, in that, in that VF2 there and stepping up to the UMC 1000 isn't the biggest jump in the world. It's one really one, uh, you know, checkbox that we're going to see here in fusion to program three plus two, and then even simultaneous five axis, we've made that very simple. So, um, the other thing that a lot of people think about when we start talking about five axis is they go, I don't need this. You know, we take something as simple as a, you know, a basic die, right? Um, you would think, you know, hey, I, I don't need a five axis to make this. I can do this on a, on a regular mill. The, the difference though is on a regular mill, we would have to load and unload this part six times to produce all the faces of this component. Now with a five axis machine, we can literally produce all five or five of the six sides and then turn this one time to produce the back and the part would be finished. Um, so I like to think of, you know, I, like I said, I used to, I used to run a machine shop and we had some verticals, we had some five axis machines and you almost get a little lazy because you don't want to start setting up multiple operations. You don't want to, you know, do all these things when you have this capability kind of at your fingertips every single day. Really, you know, with the backlog for our five axis equipment became very large because even if something wasn't some, you know, like an like an impeller like this, you know, we would want to put that on the five axis machine because our cycle time, our setup time would be reduced. We don't have to make five or six setups now. We can make one or even two setups um, to completely, you know, finish our part from from start to finish. So, um, with that being said, though, you know, talking about this five axis, talking about the type of parts, you know, basically what I'm trying to say here is you don't have to have a turbo impeller to want to invest in a machine shop. There could be a lot of value, you know, found from, you know, obviously regular, just ordinary parts that you would have multiple operations on. Um, and so the, the one other thing that I talk to a lot of companies about is, you know, even, even if we don't have a five axis, we have to go in and, you know, sometimes we have to set up something like a sign plate, right? Now I know this is specifically for grinding, but just kind of a better visualization. And sometimes we have, holes or features that are at compound angles and you know even on a sign plate here without a tooling ball and some you know some knowledge some vast knowledge of math this could be a hard setup to even produce a single component let alone moving that into something like production now for production there are you know vices and things that can help us with our you know with our setup and have something that's a little bit more rigid but if we're making one or two components you know this could be fine but this takes time right we have to set up the sign plate we have to figure out how much how, how big it needs to be between parts we need to clean off the blocks make sure everything is sitting you know properly so this can produce a lot of a lot of wasted time setting up even for a single you know one or two components if they were for prototype and then obviously for production having to clean the sign plate having to do all those things between each part that's swapped out it, 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 it takes a lot more time to produce parts that way. So the other thing that I, that I always hear is, you know, people say we can't produce parts in our machine or in our five axis. We just do one at a time. And now here you can see that they have some little valve bodies and they're on a Raptor work holding fixture there. And there's four different components there that all have, you know, positions um, that, you know, that are at different angles and things like that. So we can start to do even take our mindset away from, oh, a five axis is just for one single part because I need access. You know, there are very creative ways um, to do fixturing and to produce multiple components at the same time. Um, so 
with that being said, that kind of, you know, eliminates the need of like, oh, it's, you know, buying this big machine. It can only produce one part at a time. We can start going into production. The other thing is, you know, especially for prototypes, a lot of times we have weird and strange parts to hold on to. So sometimes we have to make a fixture or we have to, you know, do something to produce this part. With five axis, we can even, you know, a lot of times make a single component in one operation and break it off. So that's what that lower left-hand picture there in the center is, you know, just a single component. We machine all the features on it. And at the end, we kind of tab it off and there will be a little bit of residue from those tabs there, but we leave those tabs generally strong enough to hold our part or our component. And then really, you know, I can hand this to somebody to deburr this, you know, and take, you know, a minute or two minutes. And this part is completely, um, you know, completely finished. So it really eliminates me having to make a fixture because I mean, this would be kind of a hard part to hold on to. We could hold on to that, that ID there or something like that, but we do have a lot of, a lot of hangout there. So, you know, we might not get the best finishes and things like that. So, you know, really producing a part in one operation is my ultimate goal, um, especially for, you know, even prototype or even for production, you know, um, moving on. Um, this is a setup that I actually produced. Uh, this is for a Trunnion five axis uh, machine. So then it also had a pallet changer. So it's able to change out the, uh, the tables there. And I really have this kind of just set up like a, like a horizontal. I have some tombstones on there. I have some fixtures um, that, that can go, you know, uh, on and off, off of there. So we can produce multiple parts at the same time. We can, you know, obviously go in there, change these jobs out and things like that. And it really makes us a lot more flexible with the equipment that we just purchased. And I mean, even if you think about taking a tombstone, there's, you know, surface area there. So if you'd look at your machine as like, oh, you know, it's only, you know, 10 or 16 by 20 inches or whatever, and I don't have a whole lot of space. But if we start going vertically and we unfold those faces of those tombstones, if those tombstone faces are 10 inches wide per side, and you lay those all out, we have 40 inches of table now for something that we can produce, you know, vertical parts on. So really kind of thinking outside of the box and how you can use a five axis can be, you know, very beneficial. So the next thing I wanna hop into here is Fusion. So um, now we'll hop into Fusion and we'll just go over some, some parts here. So hopping into Fusion, uh, this is, and we'll start with some rotary, some four axis tool paths, and then we'll, we'll certainly move on and progress as we go. So um, this is really kind of a simple component here. Um, and this is something that, you know, a lot of cam systems, you have to pay additionally for, a, you know, a lot of packages um, to get some of these capabilities here. And we do have a manufacturing extension that we'll get into a little bit with added capabilities here towards the end. Um, but I, I do want to show some of the things that are included in, in Fusion in the, uh, in the base level here. So um, obviously, we just have a standard component here. We have a couple patterns um, that go around the part. And then here, you'll see that we have some, obviously, pockets we need to clear out. So a lot of times these could be really difficult tool paths to create. So let's create one. So I'm just gonna go to 2D. I'm gonna go to 2D adaptive clearing here. And in the adaptive clearing, uh, let's double check my tool. My tool looks good. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to uh, do a tool orientation like this, set my, my Z axis. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, come here and grab a pocket selection. So I'll grab, uh, this face right here. And then what we'll do is we'll turn on this wrap toolpath and we, we can uh, wrap that to that orientation there. Um, and what that'll give us is um, obviously when we simulate this, we can see um, it's going to give us a simultaneous toolpath that goes through and clears that area out. Devin, this is Jason on the Q&A section. I had a yeah, quick question for you. Can it really be that easy? I mean, we have a rotary with, in this case, one extra axis. All you have to do is pick where the Z direction is and it's just gonna do everything for you? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, really, it's really that simple. Um, you know, it, it can't, get, can't get much simpler than that. Um, uh, in a lot of systems, we do have to go in and make additional frames or work planes or things like that. So for multi-axis, and we'll get into this a little bit more when we start talking about dedicated five-axis machines, because then we open up not just one singular axis, but any possibility. Wow. Okay. And, and so if you pick the Z-axis on the post-processor side of things, it's just going to tell the indexer or the rotary what it needs to do. So you don't have to do any crazy math. You don't have to pick where the center of rotation is. You don't have to pick any of that stuff. Yeah, certainly. 
yeah, it's automatically going to align from your from your origin uh, and and place that place that rotary index in there. So no no math or anything needed. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. And then once you've even created you know a tool path like this. Um, in Fusion, we have something called create derived operations. So this roughing operation here isn't ideal for finishing. But one of the things we might do is right click on this operation and say create derived operation. And then in 2D milling, I can choose 2D pocket. And this will actually copy the tool and my selections and everything that I have here. And then we can just turn off the stock to leave and hit OK. And then this will produce you know, a finishing path for us. Um, in that in that same look in that same location. So really, we don't have to go through tool selection or geometry selection or anything like that over. Um, you know, you can really just convert one tool path into another there. So let's move on to the next part here. Uh, and this one, I think can be a little beneficial for like mill turn machines, you know, so we might have features like this or like, you know, pockets in the side where we want to use this. Um, where we want to use this, you know, on a lathe. And um, certainly, you know, when we when we go into you know machining on, on a part like this, we might obviously want to do all the traditional finishing and then move into you know some radial features here, um, and and doing some of those radial features. And then down here we have some pocket features. Now, uh, again, you know, this is going to be the limitation here of really how this toolpath works. And and I do see there's a comment there, um, is what this is doing is essentially making a tool path um, for this portion and it's making it flat and then it's wrapping it back to the cylinder that we selected. So um, I know it can, it can sound like it's like it's misleading or it's not doing what it says, but a lot of times with improper selection, we'll get an improper result here. So we do want to make sure that we're selecting the proper thing and, you know, getting, getting where we, where we need to be with this. Um, the other thing is some features, and I've ran into this a lot with, uh, with customers, um, you know, some features are actually five axis, right? The way the feature is drawn, it is corrected in more than just a four axis orientation. So you could use something like a SWARF, but if you don't have that on your machine, then obviously you wouldn't be able to have that as a, as a possible outcome there. Um, but, you know, these tool paths here, kind of the same thing, you know, in a mill turn machine, very easy to set up a radial tool uh, to machine the outside of this. And then obviously, you know, wrap the tool path here and we can set that into a pattern um, where we can get that result um, to go all the way around the part. So easily there with just one tool path, we can pattern once we get a good result to go all the way around the part and, and move on from there. Move on to the next thing here. So this is, um, this is part of our manufacturing extension. And what this toolpath does is this is a, a rotary toolpath. So if we look at just a plain rotary toolpath and kind of analyze what it does, uh, if we go here and grab rotary, uh, and we look at the passes page, um, if we look at this style, now the, the picture I will admit isn't probably not the greatest one here, but this is a cyclic or a continuous finishing strategy. So the only modes we have here to select are spiral, line, and circular. And spiral does just what it says. It continuously rotates the part and moves over as it's rotating. So for the features that we have here on this part in front of me, this would be a perfect strategy to, to utilize this on. And then depending on you know, maybe our, our milling head or maybe how we want the pattern to look, we could switch to something like line. And then circular is going to revolute one time and then step over um, as it's doing the passes. So if we look at uh, just a singular rotary toolpath like this, um, this is utilizing, let's double check the strategy here. This is utilizing spiral. Um, so if we simulate this and take a look at it, uh, we can see that this is going all the way around the part and this is going to spin the part and keep the part, you know, keep the tool normal to our Z axis here. And we can offset that a little bit because ideally we wouldn't want to be cutting with the, uh, with the bottom of the end mill there. Um, so, you know, you can obviously make adjustments um, to this and this is a continuous one. So I would say this is one where it works really well, continuously spinning the part. We will have some features from time to time where this would work on and we want to have like an angular limit or we only want to do a certain section of that. And you can really make this tool path, um, you know, kind of do some of those other things. But I, I will be honest with you, this doesn't work for all situations. Um, now there is, you know, a couple tricks that we can actually make steep and shallow, um, do some stuff similar to this. And maybe at the end, if we have time, I could, I could show that. Um, but 
you know, this is a really good strategy when we have geometry like this that is continuous. So something that's constantly moving or, or morphing, you know, as it goes around, imagine like a totem pole or something, or even, you know, obviously this part here um, would be a really good example for this. So let's move on. Um, so here's just kind of a, a basic milling bracket. And with this, I really just kind of wanted to show and emphasize if we were doing this in a traditional machine, um, you know, we would have to set up some sort of sign plate or make a fixture on a sign plate and then, you know, kind of jig this up um, because this, this top section here is all pretty straightforward and that'd be pretty easy to produce. Um, but there's pockets and everything here at angles, you know, on this part. So um, from our from our first setup here, uh, if we look at where our origin and everything is, if we want to produce one of these pockets on there, we'll just go to 2D and we'll go to 2D Adaptive Clearing. Um, now I'm going to come in here and pick a tool. So we'll grab, grab one of these tools. Pick this. And all we need to do inside of Fusion to get the tool to go at that orientation is just go to Geometry. We're going to invoke this tool orientation checkbox here. And then what I'm gonna do is select my Z axis and I'm just gonna to touch this face that's normal to that orientation. For my pocket, I'm going to select the bottom of that pocket. We can even add, we can even add these ones in there too. And then what we'll do is um, if I go to my heights page, we can see that this is starting from the top height is starting from the top stock top, um, which is up here right now. So what we might wanna do is even just drag this down or even say to a selection and we could select something you know, like this um, that would give us, you know, that level, and then we can hit OK, and we can see this will produce tool paths in that orientation. So really, that's that's as easy as it, that, I mean, that's as simple as it is to get uh, three plus two, um, you know, in, inside of Fusion here. Um, so if we can simulate this and just take a look at it. You can see this is running that adaptive strategy, you know, going down into that pocket and then doing this at that angle. So again, we don't have to figure out any fancy orientations. We don't have to get a tooling ball set up. We don't have to, you know, kind of measure where that is and, you know, from where we have it set up on our fixture or our jig or our sign plate um, and kind of go from there. So no math involved here. Um, really with, like I said, with modern machine tools, with dynamic work offsets and things like that, um, we're just using a single offset, just like we would in a regular three axis mill. And when we invoke this, uh, you know, our post processor is gonna output the correct machine angles um, to get to this solution. So we can move on here. Um, and this is, a, this is another component that I, that I would you know, say is similar to the other one. There's a little bit more features on this. And again, this could be something that you know, obviously we'd have to make a fixture for, we'd have to move this multiple times. Um, it's pretty curvy. So you know, depending on how we're holding on to it on that angle, there's not a whole lot here to hold on to, to you know, produce this side. Um, but getting this done in you know a single operation here, or even two different operations, um, is pretty easy. You know, in inside of Fusion, going over just regular kind of standard toolpath. Uh, from here, I do want to move on to uh, something a little bit simpler. Now, everybody can find this file in your Fusion uh, in the data panel, and when we go down to Cam Samples, um, this file is in here. So any of this, some of the parts that I've shown already are located in this area. Um, especially like the indexing and some of the wrapping tool paths. So you can go in there and actually find and kind of play with these and adjust settings on your own too. Um, now this one, I know this has probably been in a few videos before, but I want to give my take on how I would program and set something like this up. Um, so the first thing I would do is just go from design to manufacture. We want to create a setup here in Fusion. Um, because there's multiple bodies in here, Fusion doesn't know what one we want to work with. So the first thing I do is generally select the model tab right here, make this blue, and then I'll select my model. Now, if you look, my Z axis is not facing the correct orientation. And generally what I do um, is I see a lot of users try to go here and they pick you know, what one they want. This will automatically transform for you if you select the base of the arrow and then select you know, what's normal too. You can see it automatically chooses the correct solution um, for what I want it. So now I can select my Z axis. I can select my X. If my X was flipped around and I was working on the part from this side, the head of the arrow will flip it 180 degrees. So pretty simple there to set up our origin. Um, and then we can go to the side here and let's just set up our stock. So we'll go to the next page. I pretty much always use this fixed size box. And what I like to do in here is obviously put in the dimensions of my of what my part is. Now you can see we do have some random dimensions there. So maybe I wanna round this up to the nearest like a uh, half inch. 
Um, and then you can see we'll get those values. And then obviously for something like this, um, I want the part to be kind of located towards the top of the stock. So for my model position, I'll offset this from the Z top and you can see that it didn't move. Um, the reason that is is because it puts in the offset there to leave it where it was. So if I put in a small offset here of like 20 thou, you know, I was covering it up. Uh, we can then get, or maybe make it a little bigger. Just back there, yep, that looks good. Um, and then the last thing we'd want to do in here is just obviously for our post-process tab, choose our program name, program number, um, and then work coordinate system offset. Um, zero or one is equal to G54. Um, I'm going to program this with G54, um, and I'm just going to hit OK here. Um, so the first thing I like to do on a component like this, we could start with facing, and I think a lot of people start with facing, but I really want to have an optimized facing toolpath, and I think my route would be to start with a roughing toolpath. So then when I do my facing, I can really face, I, I guess, less than, um, you know, what was on there originally. You know, imagine we were making something like a pyramid. A lot of people would still start out with facing the top of the pyramid, even though there's, there's nothing on that part that is, that is flat at the top there um, because they do come to those angles. So um, I think it's a habit for a lot of people. So I just, I, I like to start with uh, adaptive clearing here. I'm going to my library here and I'm gonna grab a gen mill and we'll hit okay. And then, um, you know, obviously with Fusion, we can drive specific toolpaths and we'll kind of stay focused to uh, the, the five axis toolpaths here and we won't go too deep into like how to use Fusion. But um, here I have an expression set to use um, the tool flute length of the tool that I have selected. So it automatically determines things like my step down and uh, even, you know, my step over, maybe we'll make this point one. And we can hit okay. So without you know changing too many settings in here, uh, we have our roughing operation starting. Uh, we can move on to our our uh, you know finishing some of these operations. And what I really want to do is focus on one side. Um, so I'm going to come in here and make a drilling toolpath, and I'm going to use just the same half inch end mill. And we'll just go to geometry. I'll go to tool orientation here. Um, I'm going to touch a face that's normal to the direction I want. Um, and then you see this is set to selected faces. Um, so we could actually select the individual faces we want. Um, we could also just select an individual face and say select same diameter. Now this will pick all the holes on the part. So we could say only same Z top height, and then we can just focus on this one side. From here, I'd go to the heights page. I do want to drill through the bottom by a little bit so we can say in minus you know, 0.1. That'll get us our hole to protrude out a little bit. And then the last thing here would be the cycle choose our pecking um, and you know what cycle we want here. Uh, I'll leave it at deep drilling, 125 peck, and we can hit okay. Um, from there, let's zoom in here and check on this radius. And we can see that it's big enough for this tool to complete that. So we'll go in here and we'll do kind of that same thing. And we can even hit simulate on here and we'll turn the stock on. We can play past that first operation and then look at this drilling that we've just done. So that looks good. And if we turn this to transparent, I can see those pockets need to be machined. So we'll kind of use that same workflow from before. We'll go 2D adaptive clearing. What I'll do is go into geometry, tool orientation. You can see these are kind of at a compound angle, so they're not normal to this surface here. So we'll just go to tool orientation. We'll touch the Z axis, and then we'll go to um, pocket selection, and we'll pick that pocket. Um, the other thing I want to make sure, obviously, uh, because I'm starting up so high, I don't want my toolpath to start from this far out. I could just drag this offset um, in um, to where I, to where I you know, think it would be safe and we can hit OK. And the one thing Fusion did is let's reselect the tool here. Um, because we use this in a drilling operation, it cleared out all the feed rates. So there, now when I hit OK, it won't yell at me. And what do we have in one here? Let's see, toolpath. The warning we're getting here is because of this um, this minimum ramp diameter. So we can set this to zero, and even even pros sometimes make mistakes. Uh, so now it should morph that setting. So this is another question. I'm kind of glad I did this. Um, this is another question that I do get often. Um, I'll have people go, oh, why can't my tool, you know, go into this cavity? 
I would just have to think about everything that it's doing. So I checked my stock to leave. I noticed that my tool could still fit there in that case, but I had to look, think about how the tool is entering the part. Um, and I think, you know, maybe some other people would use a smaller tool on this. Um, so this might default to be being small enough, but on this ramp type for the helix, um, there's a helical ramp diameter. So this is what it, what we're trying to get. And then there's a minimum ramp diameter. So it's actually starting with this value and it's trying to make it that big. Um, and then, you know, ideally we probably wouldn't want this to be zero, but we want maybe, you know, 50 or 20 thou. Um, so, so that we could still get some movement to ramp down into something. If something was, you know, let's say we have a half inch tool and our, our slot is 800,000 wide. We couldn't have a 475 ramp going in there because the tool obviously at, the, at that point doesn't fit. We would have to have some sort of small number to get that to work. And we did. And then what I'll do is I'm actually going to right click on this and say, create derived operation, 2D milling. And we'll go to 2D pocket and I will turn off um, stock to leave here. We can hit okay. So that finishes that. And then we could actually, what I would, what I would probably do is just control select these two and hit copy. And then I just right click on the setup and hit paste. So it gives me two new ones. Um, and then for these new ones, I can just go in here and just reaffect what orientation I'm hitting and then what plane I'm using. And then we can do the same for this one. And if you noticed, we, this part is fairly symmetrical. So we are gonna have to perform the same thing on the other side. Um, but what I would do um, is take these operations here. So um, our adaptives and even our drill and we can shift select these. And I'm gonna right click and say, add to new pattern. Um, now the pattern I wanna use, this can be very confusing because you might say, hey, we wanna have a rectangular pattern and we wanna rotate it. Um, I really just wanna do the same thing 180 degrees from here. So we can say circular pattern and I'm gonna touch something that I know is in the center of my part here. And then this will actually take all those original tool paths that we have here um, so if I do need to make an adjustment or I'm running this for production, it's very easy to change, you know, one or two of these operations instead of changing, you know, four or eight of those operations if they were duplicated on the other side. Um, so, and then also we obviously want to keep the original, but, you know, for advanced kind of patterns, you can take, you know, a certain set of operations, you can even shift them and offset them and have it not do the original. So you're kind of making the tool path and then shifting it to another coordinate system. So these can be really, really, really powerful. Okay. And then that produces those all around my part. Um, we could even steal um, these two operations again and do the top, uh, do, the, do the top here, or you could just make new ones, go to 2D adaptive, grab that pocket, okay. And we can go in here and go to 2D pocket, grab that pocket, and then by default, it leaves material on. So we'll just shut that off, okay. So uh, that's pretty good for our part here. We can say simulate. See what we've done. All that looks pretty good. Um, we got to obviously do these angles and whatnot and these radiuses. So there's you know several different ways to do that. Um, we could even you know depending on if we want to use the bottom of the tool or the side of the tool. Um, I might even just come in here and go to 2D contour, and we can choose a orientation here. We'll say tool orientation. We'll grab the side, and then. This is the one thing that I, I feel like for new users coming into Fusion, this could be very confusing. Um, but what I want to do is I want to start right here at this radius because um, I'm going to flip this part around. There's some engraving and everything on the back side, but I want to get to at least this radius. When I click on this, see that Fusion grabs that hole outside. Um, and this could be very confusing. Um, so our contour editor, all we need to do is just hover over the contour that we have selected and click it. Um, when we do that, uh, I'm going to try to move my mouse here. Uh, you see there's a very, very small blue selection on the line that I selected here. And then everything else is selected in black. And just to put this in real simple terms, what you picked is blue and what Fusion thinks you want is black in this case. So what we want to do is change from a closed contour to an open contour. And then I just want to help Fusion. So there are a lot of like segments and everything here, um, but I want to connect it to just there. So I want to do that portion. I'm going to then hit accept. And I'm going to move over to this side because um, again, I'm going to try to you know rotate this tool path so I can reuse it. Try to think, uh, think a little bit you know smarter there um, with doing multiple operations. Like how can I do the least amount of tool paths to get to my end result? So that looks pretty good. 
Uh, if we go to heights here, because I picked the top, we would want to modify our selection. So we could say that we want it to go to here and then maybe minus hundred thousands and okay. And we obviously have to add to the retract height. Okay, and then that gives us our, our contours there. So I do see when I go to simulate this, if I right click on here and hit simulate, if I say stop on collision and we hit play, you see this goes and then I don't have my, must not have that selected in my, here. we grab these as our fixture. Now we simulate this, we should see, should see a crash. And immediately when it, hits that stock does stop on that collision so what we'd want to do here obviously in this case is move this linking pass up so we can go into this contour toolpath and this would work on both sides here because we are symmetrical we can go into our our retract height say from stock top which is there we can make this just like two inches and then we can hit okay and that'll bring up our our link to a safe pass there and then we can actually just take this and drop it in that pattern and that'll produce it on both sides. So from there, if we're ready to post this out, we can just right click on this operation, hit post process, and you know, obviously go in here and pick our machine model. Maybe we're running this on that UMC 1000 that I had, and we can hit post. This is to my desktop. And we got some code. So this has, you know, our, our rotary addresses in it, has all the proper codes and everything for that machine. So um, the one other thing that I, that I want to show, and I think the thing that people want to do the, the most often is, you know, when we start talking about five axis, you know, they, they think it's hard. And I've shown here that three plus two is, is relatively easy. Um, when we move into something like uh, this, this part here, now this is a component that I've actually produced. Um, the, the main thing that I want to do is I really just want to take a three axis toolpath and I want to convert this into five axis. So one of the things that's in the extension and is really powerful with steep and shallow is the ability under multi-axis here to make a vertical toolpath, which means like just a three axis toolpath. And then what I want to do is just automatically convert that to five axis. That'd be super great if I could just have a, a checkbox to do that. Now, in Fusion, there is a checkbox to do that. It's right here. With the collision mode set to automatic, this setting right here really just takes a three axis toolpath and you can put as short or and as fat of a tool as you want, because obviously we want it to be short and rigid. Um, and Fusion is going to move and articulate the tool out of the way when it would collide. So with this part of this component that I have here, let's, let's analyze this a little bit. Um, Everybody likes draft analysis, but I'm a big fan of this accessibility analysis. Now for, um, you know, different parts when I'm, when I'm machining, uh, this, this kind of does like a draft analysis, but it really gives me from my tool orientation. So if I pick the part here and I pick my direction, I might have to turn on my origin here to get something flat, but I'm gonna machine it from this angle. You can see that there's some red areas on here. Now, this is useful to me because if we look at this from the z-axis normal, from the top of the part here, I don't see any red areas in this orientation. And that's because some of these faces here are, are undercut or occluded from the orientation that I'm using. So I would like to have a, a smooth tool path on this bottom portion here. And I would like to just make one tool path. Now, obviously with a short tool, you see we have a pretty high vertical wall here. Um, and it'd be hard to kind of get a tool in there and be hard to think about all the different orientations the tool needs to face to you know, get a valid solution here. So all I've done was I just took a, the steep and shallow tool path. And if we hit simulate here, I just use that automatic checkbox. And I kind of tricked it because steep and shallow, a lot of people think of it as, oh, it's you know, just kind of used for the entire part. Well, you can use it for that, but you can also segment it out to only do the steep areas or to only do the shallow areas. Um, and really what we've done here or what I've, what I've done is just taken out the steep areas so that we're not doing a contour tool path on this part at all. I'm just utilizing a parallel to do this floor. So if we draw the, the whole tool path here, we can see that we get those, we get those lines and we get the, the tool path and this is the direction that it's moving. And I'll put this back to tail because I think it looks messy when I show it like that, but hit play. 
And this is just going to go back and forth. Now you can see this is full five axis. Um, so the tool is tipping out of the way. Um, even at the end here, we're getting a little bit more articulation because of from the top, um, you know, we have, we have that little occluded angle that we can't get to. Um, and what's nice about this is the way this is smoothed and blended out. Um, traditionally, I would say the HSM tool paths are, are good at this, but they don't work in all situations. And really the brains behind steep and shallow, this is coming from power mill. So things like point distribution and, you know, tilt smoothing and things like that, where we're smoothing out and not creating like really kind of herky jerky motions on our machine um, is really beneficial here. And ultimately what I would like to see this do and what this does is in the center here where it can stand up the tool. Um, if we look at this from the front, you can see there's no articulation here, right? There's no five axis motion. We've really gotten to a solution here where we can lock three plus two during a five axis tool path and produce uh, a very clean you know, finish because with moving all the all five axes at once, it's, it's very, it, it looks really cool. It might not run as fast as a solution like this on your machine. And you might not get a, a good, sur a, a perfect surface result because you have things like volumetric error when you have all five axes on your machine moving at once. So what this does is lock in that orientation, which like I said, is fast and effective. And then when we get to the opposite side, it literally just tips out of the way and produces a collision free tool path um, so that we don't have any sort of, you know, any sort of collisions. And really just with a simple checkbox, um, we can produce a tool path like that. I do want to showcase some of the other things that are in here, or at least kind of try to explain um, how these work. So the primary mode is for the entire tool axis. So you can see here that my goal was to have a three plus two or convert a 3D toolpath into five axis. And that's what I did. Um, but this primary mode, we can also have this for the entire toolpath. So, um, and I'll show this in a minute here, but we can have like uh, lead and lean, which will use kind of the surface normal and point to a certain you know direction based on the surface that it's touching. But the ones that I feel like are really powerful are from point and to point, and then from curve and to curve, which are kind of advanced options of that. But I wanna explain the point because I think that's the easiest to understand. So when we say from point, from a point, imagine I have a tool and I want it to always tip from a point that I selected. So we can do that inside of Fusion. That would work great for something like a cavity where we have the tool trying to fit into somewhere to machine and we always wanna make sure that it's safe and pointed towards a single direction. Um, now, from a, uh, to a point, we work on something like a globe. Imagine we had a globe and we put a point in the center of that globe and we said, no matter where you are, I always want you to point towards the center of this point. And maybe it's a, a, a different surface and it changes a lot, but you always want to point towards a, a center like that, which would work good for you know, the outside of a part. Um, and then obviously more advanced options of that would be actually creating a curve or a spline or something like that, and then attaching your tool to that. Um, but this is for the entire tool path. Again, maybe that's not what I want. Maybe I want collision avoidance and I don't like the result that I'm getting from automatic. We also have these same settings for just when the tool collides in a vertical fashion here, um, or even in a, in a, in a five axis fashion there. Um, but we have the two point from point to curve and from curve so that if the automatic isn't giving me the desired solution that I like, um, I have the ability to come in here and affect how my collision avoidance is handled by choosing my own solution. Um, and, and, the, and this is you know obviously really good because it gives us the power to, you know, pretty much make it do what we want it to do. Uh, the last thing here is once we reach tool axis limits, so maybe my limit type is, I wanna leave it at maximum tilt um, and continue machining, um, but we could also restrict this to four axis milling. Um, and then in here, once we reach our maximum tilt, maybe for this part, I don't wanna tip past 30 degrees. We can put that in there. And then the last section here is areas beyond limit. This chooses what happens once we reach that limit. Do we lock at 30 degrees and continue machining down? Do we trim the tool path off, anything that has a solution past 30 degrees? Um, so there's obviously a, a ton of ways to use and utilize this um, inside of Fusion. And then the last thing that I'll show in here is um, kind of a from point solution. Now this is kind of like a, a little fan here and you can see that what I've done is put a little point right here. And then I've just created a steep and shallow tool path and I've told this to be from point. So whenever this, once this tool connects with the part here, and I'll try to slow this down, it's going to stay connected to that point. 
So obviously we have some occlusion here, like an undercut there um, where we can't see this from the top and even over here. But with this solution here, with this point, you can see that the tool is doing exactly what I want and it's staying connected to this area, which I know is safe. So I have the ability not only to choose an automatic solution, but even if I have a preferred solution that you know the automatic isn't getting to, I have the control here to adjust that as I see fit. So with that being said, um, that's all for the demonstration. Let's hop back to PowerPoint here. And yeah, Jason, you're a little little quiet, but we uh, I'm going to do a quick summary and then we'll hop into some live Q&A here. Perfect. So uh, in this webinar, we covered, obviously, um, why 5-axis could bring added value to your business. Um, also, you know, that most multi-operation parts can save, can save time by being manufactured in a 5-axis machine. Um, we, we talked a little bit about the barrier to entry, the skills gap, um, things like that. And then we did went over some examples of some fourth and fifth axis parts. And then we can hop into Q&A. Perfect. Can you hear me better this time? Yeah. Excellent. So we had a couple of questions from Jamie and Sean all about rotary early on in your discussion. And so I would like to ask you, can you explain the difference between the rotary toolpath again and the wrap toolpaths? And while you're doing that, excuse me, while you're doing that, can you also explain how you would do roughing or multiple depths on the rotary toolpath? Yeah, so um, as far as the multiple depths or the roughing, um, it really depends on the part. I think the most efficient way would probably be to do uh, in different orientations, like an adaptive clearing, because I would want to use a lot of the flute um, some things that I have done in the past are extend the part out a little bit. And then I kind of use the spiral as like a adaptive because, and I'll tell it to move over at a certain step over, but I have to extend the part so that it starts uh, safely off the part and it doesn't start with full engagement. And then essentially what it does is, is, you know, depending on the part and your shape and things like that, it'll use the side of the flute as it's stepping over to, to cut. Cause essentially it would be just, sending the, the tool down, you know, start rotating, and then we'd actually move in um, to the part as it's spinning. Um, so that's one way to do it. The other way would be to, you know, use stock to leave or possibly even a different model, depending on the part. I guess I'm trying to think of a, a broader solution more than a specific example, and then just do multiple depths where you could go down maybe a quarter inch of a, at a time uh, and, and things like that. Very cool. And then Brianna had a question about the editor that you showed when you were posting. Can you tell us a little bit about what that editor was and how Brianna might be able to get it? Yeah, so specifically, um, that editor is called Visual Studio Code. And the first time you do post-process in Fusion, it does get downloaded. Um, now, you probably realize that, you know, if you do have it, mine looks a little different than yours. Um, that's just because there's there's different themes in there where you can make it look kind of a certain way. And then when you have the, um, when you have, there's a Fusion 360 post processor utility um, that automatically colors some of the code in there so that we see, you know, kind of what's a G code, what's an M code, things like that. Oh, very cool. That's super helpful. Okay. And then what about mitigating collisions? Jesse wanted to ask about that. I know that in Fusion 360, when you're doing your simulation, it's going to show you in red if you're going to have a collision. And of course, you could also stop the simulation at that time. What are some other things that you would do to make sure to mitigate or to plan ahead to expect a collision and therefore plan around it? Yeah, I mean, so I'm looking at the question here. It says, do you have specific or post specific uh, for machine tools to migrate to mitigate collisions. Um, and there are posts for different machine tools. There are also special scenarios that some machine tools have um, where you can turn on a specific, you know, uh, feature function where you're kind of locking out one axis and using the rotary instead um, to maybe avoid some collisions. So um, as far as while I'm simulating um, and, 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 for the, and for the posting specifically, Generally, the you know the post is going to do what we have there on um, what we have on the screen. Um, I feel like that the most the most dangerous part is probably to and from the toolpath. 
And that would be something that I would make sure is set up properly in the post. Sometimes it's not the most, uh, let's say, efficient uh, result, um, but it is a safer result that works for more situations. So like, obviously, if I'm machining a part where I'm in incrementing an angle at five degrees, it's kind of, it, it's a little bit of a waste to lift the machine, the tool all the way up, send it home, have the machine, have it rotate to the next portion and then have it return and go back. But that is, although it wastes a lot of time, it is the safest solution because if you do have a big part in there and it was just moving up to the top and it was a really tall part, when the, when the rotary returns back to zero, it could then smack that tool by going to another location because we're kind of taking out some of those things for efficiency. So I think it would be really, um, you know, situation, situation dependent. And then it did say you're running a DVF and a lot of arrow work, I'm doing a lot of arrow work. Yeah, I mean, so um, looking at that specific machine, there, there probably are some things you could add, maybe, you know, sub programs or how it's retracting to make it, um, make it a little bit more effective in just avoiding, you know, and most, most collisions that you would have. Very cool. And I would ask you, you know, you showed some features that are part of the Fusion 360 standard package, so to speak, and you also so showed some features that are part of that machining extension. Can you repeat for us like the top three reasons why someone would want or even need that machining extension over the standard Fusion 360? Yeah, I mean, generally when you're getting into if 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 rotary or steep and shallow, because steep and shallow does have a lot of a, a lot of solution um, possibilities there. I think for me, those are some really big ones. Um, the other the other one that we didn't touch on a whole lot would be toolpath editing. So even for something like that rotary toolpath, if it was producing um, uh, a toolpath on a portion of the part that I didn't want or couldn't get rid of. Um, you can actually go into the toolpath editing and edit out some of those things in the in the toolpath there. So the the other thing that I like to equate the manufacturing extension is, and I hear this a lot because I do talk to customers often, is they say, you know, we could buy it for a day, we could buy it for a month. Uh, I might use it, you know, here and there. But I feel like it's almost like if we equate it to something as simple as a Ferrari. Let's say I put a Ferrari in your garage, and I tell you, you can drive whenever you want, but you know, it, it, it's in the garage and and, and whatever. You're gonna want to start using it right today we don't i don't have ferrari in my garage but if someone put one in there i would want to take it to the store and i would want to take it to the to the park and things like that and and drive it around just because i don't have it today doesn't mean i wouldn't use it and what i've found and seen a lot with customers is they think you know oh i don't need the manufacturing extension or i don't need to modify you know tool pass all the time um because you don't have access to that tool when when you really have that tool in front of you at all times you know you kind of want to use it a lot so i mean i, I that's Simple analogy. Does that kind of make sense, Jason? I think so. You know, it reminds me, you know, from my background, I'm a little bit more in the 3D printing world. And there were times where I'd wonder to myself, like, should I 3D print this or should I wait and 3D print it later? Part of me is just being a little bit frugal. Maybe I don't want to waste the like the material for the 3D print. And what I've learned in my life is if you think you want to 3D print something, the answer is always yes. Just 3D print it right away. And how would that apply in this case? It would apply that if you think you might want to have access to those toolpaths, just get access to those toolpaths and you're going to find yourself using them more and more and gaining efficiencies. And those efficiencies will more than pay for itself in terms of like the cost of that upgrade, at least in my opinion and from my experience with our customers as well. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I did see a question come in uh, that, that Jason had answered in the chat, and I, I did want to address it. Uh, Mitch asked specifically, or Jason answered, that we recently acquired Camplete, which specializes in you know post processing and machine simulation. Um, so that that is something that you know obviously we have here at Autodesk now, and we are going to be you know obviously rolling out and getting some more you know some more knowledge about it because it is new to us. Um, Fusion can currently though, in the background, and we've been public about this, so this is in our, our roadmap and whatnot. Um, we do have machine simulation that hopefully in the future will be coming to Fusion. Um, I do have it in you know, my Fusion today, obviously you know, testing it out and things like that, but we are looking at a kind of a parallel solution along with Camplete. So Camplete is going to be a lot more specialized on you know, post-processing and machine collisions, and it has a lot more functions than just like a basic kinematic simulation that Fusion will be doing. Um, but that is something also, you know, that we're developing in, in parallel there. 
Cool. Last question for today. Matt just asked, if you're working on a toolpath that you know has no interferences or no collisions, and you copy it or you pattern it around the particular part, and there could potentially be interferences on like the area that it's patterned around, mm -hmm. will those new toolpaths be calculated separately? Will the, the interferences or the collisions be calculated or shown to you? How would that work? Yeah, so whenever we use a pattern like that, if we had a specific situation where there could be collisions on one part and not on another, um, we are patterning that, that first toolpath, so it's not calculating it again. Um, with something like a component pattern where we can have parts at different orientations even on the machine, when we're doing that first part and we're making all those operations, they're for that first part, and we're just assuming in a component pattern that we've positioned all the other parts to work in a, in a similar fashion there. So they are, they are not generated separately. But if you're in the simulation and there happens to be a collision caused by it, would it tell you about it? Um, if, you had the, um, if you had the fixture selected and the other, the other components selected, then yes, it would show you a gap. Perfect. So just to repeat that, the actual calculation of the tool path wouldn't be taking into account those collisions, but the simulation very much will. Yeah. Or can. Perfect. So I guess that's all for the questions we have time for today. The last part of this, Devin, if I remember your agenda correctly, is going to be how to reach out for more information. Many of you already asked for the link to the recording, but if you're interested in learning more about the software, regardless of where you happen to be, whether it's US, Canada, or as you could tell, we have a lot of different phone numbers all across Europe, please feel free to reach out to us. Give us a call, send us an email, we have people like Devin that clearly know what they're talking about, and we can learn a little bit more about your business, what your needs are, and then help you find the exact right product for you, whether it's Fusion 360 standard, whether it's Fusion 360 with the manufacturer, sorry, the machining extension, or it's another one of our specialty products here at Autodesk. We are trying to give you the best tools for what you're trying to achieve. I'd like to give a special thanks to Devin Dupuy for hosting today's webinar, and also thank you all for joining today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Devin, any final remarks? No, I really appreciate everybody hanging out with me. Um, you know, hopefully everybody uh, saw the uh, the email and everything there. If you do have you know additional questions or concerns about Fusion 360, um, you know certainly certainly reach out there. You know, Jason and myself, you know, like you said, would be happy to help out. Excellent. Thank you all and have a great day today. Thanks, everybody.